Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed, your wildlife photography and outdoor adventure podcast. It's 2020, it's winter, so they say, according to the calendar. The Wild and Exposed team, Michael Morrow, Ron Hayes, and myself, Mark Raycroft, and our talented producer at her desk, Missy McKenzie, are all on board to bring you today's podcast. It's been a great year so far. We've had some fantastic guests on the podcast, but today we're reining it in. We're doing what so many of our listeners enjoy hearing about. It's a whole podcast on pro tips from various aspects of the field, whether it be gear, travel, even as Ron Hayes said earlier before the podcast, philosophical perspectives on the world we live in through wildlife photography. Guys, how are you doing? Doing good. It's been quiet, though. I'm itching to get outside. That's a fact. Well, I saw on social <laughs> media a reason. I mean, it was a shock this week. I mean, it's a rare, sorry, I'll correct that, a super duper rare opportunity in Wyoming, a mountain lion on the edge of town with a kill that all kinds of people got. Amazing images, really, considering the location. Right. Considering the location and the circumstance, um, a few people got some amazing images and all. We'll put a link to the show notes on a couple of them because they were extraordinary for, you know, a wild mountain lion. Just having that opportunity, number one, is is something that you don't have happen every day. Number two, have it happen in an area that's accessible and photographable because it was open. Uh, that it, it was a great opportunity and short lived uh, because the cat ended up getting a lot of pressure just because of where it was. Uh, on the edge of a town and that kind of thing. So a lot of photographers out there, you know, I don't know if it made the cat nervous or not. That's a little bit of the feedback that I got. The, she was kind of hinky, um, but she ha did have a kill right there. So, you know, she's going to revisit it at least until she's done or gets pushed clear off. But yeah, those, the group that I saw is, you know, a great group of photographers over in Western Wyoming unfortunate the unfortunate part for me was it was clear on the other side of the state and i couldn't get over there but that's the way it is you got to be happy for for those that got it and they all did a fantastic job of capturing the the images that they got well the right place at the right time and, and just i mean good fortune to be accessible and safe in this i mean it's not ideal in the sense that from what i saw on social media people are on a uh, edge of a town photographing it, but it's in a place where they're not having to approach the cat in an uncomfortable way. And there's a fresh snowfall, right. which made the, the three or four really standard images that I saw look fantastic. It just wild. Mm -hmm. and, and the cat ran in the images toward the kill site, apparently, because again, not toward the photographers from my understanding, it was just some yeah, ravens yeah. or something that were, that were feeding as well on the carcass to scare them off, which created amazing action images. So it was just a rare opportunity. I mean, when do you get that, right? That quality of exactly. image online and, and a whole bunch of people were able to capture it. And like you said, there there's definitely some people that I know well on social media who capitalized on that and, and congrats to them. That's yeah, cool. I'll, fantastic on a big HD metal. Yeah, give a quick shout out to Savannah Burgess. Uh, Savannah Rose Wildlife is her Instagram handle. And I'll get permission to to share a link to that image because the one that she got, I think, for me, is is the best image that I've seen. Just like you said, a lot of snow flying. The cat was jumping off a you know a short little rock face, and uh, she just did a great job. Congrats to her for sure, and you know the others that were out there as well. But I I really like that image that she got. Definitely shows the power of the cat. And for those that don't know, it's just a matter of going to our website at wildandexposed.com. Hit the Explore tab that pops up on the opening page, for, and then that'll come to the podcast page. Hit this podcast and the show notes. You scroll down, and the images and links that we discussed in today's show notes, well, on today's podcast, will all be there in the show notes. That's how you find it. While you're at it, leave a comment. Leave a review on whatever platform that you're listening to us on, again, because that helps us to gain traction in this world of podcasting. Definitely appreciate it if you take a minute to do that. Throwing that out there. Michael, back in Denver. 
Yeah, just for a little bit. Then I'm back on the road for a four-week uh, work assignment all around the country. Then back, hopefully, up to Alaska after that. And then we were just in Alaska. That was cool for a, a week. It was weird. It was... Uh, we got there, and it was like 45 degrees. It was warmer in Alaska than it was here in Denver. In Anchorage, I should say. And then... It's crazy because everything just started to melt. Everything was just a sheet of ice with a sheet with a running water on top of it. Oh wow! For a day, and then that night it snowed, and it was um, more snow than they'd ever received on New Year's Day. The most snow ever recorded on New Year's Day, and then it proceeded to get cold. So it's been in the minus since what the second I think of. January, mm-hmm. all the way to to now. I was talking to a buddy up there yesterday. It was minus twenty one Fahrenheit. So, but some of the images I've been seeing out there are spectacular. When you get that ocean right there and the fog, and then you got minus twenty one. Everything's just a frost. Everything's frosty. It just looks super cool. To, so it's while the conditions are challenging. I mean, I think you could get some a bunch of cool stuff. So I didn't get a chance to do too much. I did more work on the computer than I did anything else while I was there, but it's a cozy little place to do that. And then um, I went hiking one day with Jerry Harrod, AK Scenic on Instagram. He's got a super secret ninja spot to try to find some antlers. <laughs> he uh, swore me to secrecy and we took off, but it was after the snow. Because chances of finding antlers right after a fresh snow that's tw- two feet of snow. I mean, if an antler falls off, it's just going to go into the snow, right? So your chances of ever seeing it. So unless you actually see an antler fall off, I mean, your chances of actually finding one are pretty slim and none. But we did see a lot of moose, and we put in like a probably a three or four mile hike in twenty four inches of snow. That was that was good exercise for the day. Snowshoes or just boots? No, I took snowshoes, but a lot of people ski this route that he was on, that he was going down. And if you stay on those skis, you're sinking, but you're not sinking a lot. I mean, but the minute you got off those ski tracks, you're down to your knees. So we didn't, I think it would have been more work to have snowshoes. But if you'd have been without those tracks, you definitely wanted snowshoes. I would have never went. That's too far to go with snowshoes. I don't know if you guys ever walked in snowshoes. I hate them. I mean, they're, they're effective, but it's a lot of work. I like it. Some of the modern ones that are smaller. You know, yeah. you can get different sizes depending on the conditions. And if, if it's not too bad, then that's easy, easier going to have a smaller set. Walking in the, on that ski track, was it was fine. And we saw moose. And every moose we saw was antlerless. But they were all far enough out where you just couldn't tell if it was a bull that had lost his antlers or if it was a cow. You know, it's a fun reason to get exercise, right? But yeah, yeah with too much snow, it's hard. With the weight of a moose antler, it's going to fall to the ground and then snow on top. Right? Exactly. I hardly ever find them propped up on something, right? Right. Right, exactly. So, And then I haven't been doing any shooting here in Colorado at all. It's just all been in the office figuring out this podcast stuff. Which is an ongoing project, right? We were working on audio before we started today, dialing that in more and more all the time. Never stops. I mean, there's always something to improve. There's always something to make better. I was talking with another buddy up in Alaska. His name is Ray Minzy. He was saying that our podcast fluctuate sometimes with the with the audio you know i don't listen to i listen to ours but i listen to it on our equipment which makes it sound great but that's the same equipment we recorded on but if you're listening to it on a, in a car or something he was saying that sometimes my voice goes crazy loud and then you guys will be subdued a little bit so if he's driving down the road i can scare the bejeebies out of him just by talking you know so that got me thinking and i thought well we better fix this well we like to keep our listeners awake and in the program. Especially if you're driving early in the morning to your favorite shooting spot. We don't want you falling asleep on the way to your spot. So Ray, actually Ray's got some pretty cool stuff here lately. And he's actually the inspiration behind one of my pro tips this morning. So we'll talk more about him. But he is K-A-C-N-A-M-P-R. So anyhow, that what's up with you there, Mr. Raycroft? Have you been out and about or are you just stuck behind the computer? Oh, Super glued computer to your season. keyboard. Yes. Yes, it's computer season. It's editing full on. The, the weather is all over the map here. It's the middle of winter. We're having pouring rain today, which historically would be a foot of snow. 
It's uh, two days ago. It was super cold. Today it's pouring rain. Tonight they're saying freezing rain from midnight through morning. So be skating tomorrow, and then warm up through. No, actually, cool, cool down more through the day. Back down to sun. It's going to clear high pressure and and be much colder by afternoon. So hot and cold flashes. But to have us, we're having so much rain today. Uh, 50 millimeters of rain, which I don't know what's that. Two inches, inch and a half. Five like centimeters, yeah. inch and a half. Inch and um, half yeah. So with everything frozen, it just goes off the surface everywhere, right? So it creates a bit of an issue. And then if it freezes tonight, then everything becomes a skating rink. So it'll be interesting. That sucks for wildlife, too. I mean, it just becomes so hard, hard for them to feed. And, I mean, the, the rate in which animals can't survive a winter like that is huge. Well, yeah, just to thermoregulate and keep a, te- a core temperature when they're pouring rain today they're i mean it's going to be drenched and then freezing rain all night long then the temperature plummets i mean that's hard on any animal so right. it's you know, it's not ideal it, and there's no snow base so when the temperature drops you know animals like i'm drawn to like ungulates or deer or moose you know, they'll bed in the snow and that actually insulates them a bit when the temperature drops with nothing on the ground and the temperature drops it, you know it's not the same so they're a bit more vulnerable that way with these these swings it's an issue um, you know, they can get hypothermia if it's enough of a swing and that's, that's fatal for them. Exactly. You know, I think about that a lot, especially, you know, just being in Alaska and having those minus temps, you think mm-hmm. about the moose and you think about all the animals that are out there, the ravens, the foxes, everything. And, you know, it was, it was cold enough and dry enough that I, everything is suited for that. That's why they live there, right? They can make it. But if you start throwing in the rain like the 45 degree temperature we had and then it freezes and then they can't paw through the the layer of ice to get to what they need to eat or they get hypothermia yeah it just sure it's horrible yeah we take the snow over this this time of year for sure i think we've had our driveway plowed twice this winter which is you know unheard of some winters would be 15 times by now so is missy ready to, to give us the high fives on these pro tips or we've got some fantastic. Well, hold on. Pro Before tips. we do that, I want to know yeah. what you're editing. What is today's edit? Consistent? Today's? Yeah. Is this like six months ago when you were shooting bears in Canada or was this uh, three months ago when you were shooting moose in Alaska or is this whitetails in this is, Ontario? What is it? It's all payback right now. You know, I, I love what I do for a living, but we, I, play in the field from August through through the month of December and just shoot and shoot. And I don't have time with, with the editing style that I do. That's all our conversation we've touched on before, guys, I know. But I don't have time to dive into it, or Pilly and I don't, until winter. And so it's payback. I'm catching up on all of it. And it's just a matter of market as to the order of sequence of what I edit. So I'm, I'm editing whitetails right now. I've prepped about 500 new images and I'm just doing the final tweaks on them and creating the high-res JPEGs ready for market and then the low-res watermarked, and then that'll be done. Then I'm going to go back and fine-tune the Woodland Caribou because I have some projects that I want to promote and launch with that, so that'll be in the next week as well, and then roll on from there. I still haven't done the July moose that we did in Alaska last year, and we had, we had some good fun there, so I'm looking forward to those. So. It's, it's a whirlwind as quickly as I can get stuff done. It's the new year, right? So we always have this break. As in any profession faces this with the holidays. From mid-December through till after New Year's, I mean, I don't want to, unless there's a, a need that at that time that needs to go to press and, the, and my clients want something, of course I deliver it. But I'm not going to promote and market in that time because people's heads are elsewhere. They're looking forward to the holidays. They want a break. They don't want a new project on their desk. So everything starts in the new year. And I don't even not even the first few days in the new year for me, because, again, everybody's just getting recalibrated back to work. So now it's a time that I like to get stuff out for new projects, you know, that some of the publications are mapping things out for the next year or two and just plant those seeds of ideas, these proposals. So it's a matter of getting all that. So it's a it's a scramble, exciting, fun time, but it's all office based right now. That being said. You know, we do need breaks, so, you know, once every week or so, we'll we'll do a road trip and find something to photograph, head up to Algonquin Park or 
other places that we know where there are animals. I'm hoping to get some Ontario elk and snow uh, in the next couple of weeks as well. They'll hold their antlers for quite a while yet. So if we get the right weather and nice fresh snowfall, they're a few hours north of me. So it's, it's more, even that distance is quite a difference in the winter climate from where we are along the Great Lakes, along the shoreline here. It's buffered a bit by the lake lake effects. So some winters, when it's colder, we get a lot more snow, but not this year. So uh, driving three hours north will look like the middle of winter compared to our lawn that we have here right now. So it's things like that, just to take a break, you know, I, and we sit for hours and hours and, you know, it's hard on my eyes or anybody's eyes to be two feet from a screen for 10 hours a day. You know, it's by the end of it, it's, I either cross-eyed or can't focus on anything or I start getting these flashing lights in my eyes. You've got to get up and take breaks. So every few days to hit the road and do something fun is important too. Shake it up. That's where my head's at. But hopefully in three months, that'll all be behind and we can start mapping out the next year and what imagery we want to collect. And it's a, For me, it's about to average 80 degrees a day Fahrenheit. Sorry, are we, are we is doing that this podcast in, Indoor June? temperature? I don't know. What's... That, is, that is what the temperature is going to be in the Dominican Republic. Ah. Oh, yeah, you're going. So what is it? When do you leave for that? Tonight. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's why we have the text to do today, the podcast this morning. Right. Why are we doing another morning podcast, team? Especially when it's call, before Mark's, already. Mark's time to get up. <laughs> his winter alarm is until like noon it's uh well i edit through the night if i'm on a roll i just keep going yeah i'm more of a night owl in the winter too it's dark so much of the time what's the difference right it's dark by five o'clock so exactly. so but, that was I, I have one one more thing on that but before we do that so ron just tell everybody what you're doing you're going to the dominican republic for what like a week or so yeah just for a week First time we've ever taken a any kind of a family trip like that. All the, the the kids, my kids are all graduating and spreading their wings. So we just thought last opportunity. So we're gonna take advantage of it. And as of right now, I'm not taking a camera. I'm taking action cams, but I'm not taking a camera. That may change between now and when we leave. However. I would, that was my I'm, question. That was my next question. Are you taking anything or are you just going to family it up? Um, I'm thinking of taking a short, just a short lens and, and one camera body, but I am taking uh, GoPros, the action cam and the, and the pocket because we're going to do some things. It'd be pretty fun to, to have that memory of, you know, zip lines and that, that kind of thing. Right. So that's the plan as of right now, but it may change. I don't, I'm not sure I can go somewhere new like that and not have at least something. And I know everybody else will be sleeping so I can go up, shoot the sunrise anyway. Right. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> cool. That is awesome. awesome. The only, only thing I wanted to add was when you were saying that the nights are so long, um, when when we were in Alaska, it's crazy to see the change in the number of minutes per day. That's a big thing. You watch the TV news in Alaska, and, and every night with the weather, they'll say, these are the number of minutes we lost of sunlight, or these are the number of minutes we gained. And from when we got there to when we left, it, it gained two minutes a day. So you can see how fast that really starts to accelerate as as winter comes, or January, February, March start coming on. Like everybody's favorite winter month in, in Alaska is March because the days are getting fairly long, but you still have good snow and it's just, uh, you know, unless you're exposed to it, you really don't pay attention to it. But once you start saying, okay, well, it's just, it went from a minute 30 to two minute 30. And then you start saying, okay, in 10 days, that's 23 minutes of sunlight that we're going to gain. It's crazy mm -hmm. how fast it starts. And it goes up to like seven minutes a day, I think is. I remember when we were in Homer last March, that's what they said. It was seven, seven minutes a day was the change. So you figure out that 10 point. days, you're over an hour worth of daylight that that's, you gain. Yeah, that's, that is crazy. It's crazy to think about. So then Mark's uh, alarm changes from noon to 
Uh, back to ten. Back to back to ten. <laughs> for for the record, it's it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, noon but is pushing if I do, it. If I do edit till two a.m., then yeah, I'm back in the office at ten a.m. Right? I mean, I still need the hours of sleep. There, I saw a TED talk on my travels about the importance of sleep, and it's it's a big it's a big deal. I've been hearing yeah. a lot about that lately. It is. So I've been trying to do that too. Get Especially more the younger. It's important for the younger crowd, you said? No, the younger we get, the more we, the oh, more right, we need. Oh, right, right. We want to make it last. Now, for those, you know, there are times where we, we've had trips where we'll get by on five hours a night, after night after night after night, especially when the days are long, right, in the far north in shooting season in early autumn and stuff. And after a week of that, it's it's a fun marathon, but, oh, man, your butt's dragging and tired. So... I don't we think do I could do what I used time. to do. No, it's so no eight way. hours, seven, seven or eight hours sleep, even nine some nights, yep. makes a difference through the day. And they say it makes a big difference for one's health too. So, TED talks. Yep. yep. All right. So All right. I think let's dive into these pro tips. I, I interrupted long enough. Oh, no, we're all that's good. Nice to hear what you're doing on the road for a month too. Wow, Dominican Republic. All right. Well, send me some pictures. I'll be at the computer. Yeah, the so good I, thing is you got your iPhone. You always have got your iPhone. a phone. Yep, exactly. Well, and you can do so much with that. I tell you, the vlogging stuff that on our Australian, New Zealand trips, we use so much with action cameras and the phone for storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm really curious to hear how the GoPro 8 compares to the DJ Osmo action. That's that's one thing that I'm going to do while everybody else is asleep. Also, is just go do some comparison side by side kind of things and just see what the difference looks like. And I, it's it's not completely comparable now. This is another little rabbit trail, but they have it's kind of like the Osmo Pocket. After the initial release, it was a while before that kind of what accessory pack came out. And so the accessories aren't the accessories that are going to make the GoPro eight do what I kind of think it's going to do aren't out yet. The additional microphone, there's a screen, there's a light bar, like an led light bar that they're going to have. Um, those aren't out yet. So I don't have those. So, you know, for vlogging per se, it's not going to be everything that it could be yet, but I still, I still think that it's got some potential to be the perfect, carry around camera for when you're out in the woods just documenting you know what's going on you know if you're gonna just take one camera down there i get this question all the time from an old podcast that we did or actually we were using it in alaska but and i don't remember the name of this product but it was that silicone uh, sleeve that you had that went over the camera that would be cool to take down there if you're only going to take one camera and one lens and Mm -hmm you know, do some more testing with that. Cause everybody's been asking me, did it work? Did it work? And I said, yeah, it worked, but the Outtech or Outtech. Yeah, yeah. We didn't get a good chance to test it. You know, we didn't yeah, get we any just of... like stellar images, but it, we know that it works. We know that it didn't leak. It's reliable. It's probably not something you're going to take deep, deep water, but if you're just doing that half water, half landscape shots, right. it might be kind of cool to try out on sunrises or something. And I wish that's why I wish I would have been with you guys in in Whittier with that or that I would have left it there. So you guys could have tested it in Whittier in that clear water Yeah. Um, because the the water that we were in, we did get some some decent images, uh, but the water was pretty murky. Right. You know, there was still a lot of silt in it. And uh, so the image quality wasn't great, but I can't say that it was because of the the housing. I think it was likely. Oh, for sure. It had to be the water. You know, circumstances. The water. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that is a good idea. You're going to be snorkeling and stuff there. That's what I'm, I'm understanding then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Snorkeling so and there's some, be uh, cool to see that with we did. I did everything with the action cameras for snorkeling in at the Great Barrier Reef. And I was super impressed with the video quality. And it's wide angle. So the sea turtles had to, you know, they, they were chill. They'd swim by a foot away kind of thing and the light on their shell and stuff was magnificent for the video i really liked what came out for quality on the 4k video i did switch it to still mode and 
the pictures are fine for social media, totally fine, or just show and tell for family. But it's not something I be sending to my publisher. Right. So if you for stills, I, I mean, I didn't do a lot. I just did enough testing with it on the stills that and switch back to video. It was 90 percent video more than that. But for stills, that makes more sense, maybe with the DSLR, depending on what your target output was. But the action cams are so small and so easy to work with. Yeah. Assume you get close to your subject, right? Yeah, the only issue is um, the safe in the rooms. I don't know if it's big enough for a DSLR. So uh, that's something that I've got to figure out before tonight. <laughs> uh, you know what that means? Fanny pack. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think you should get like a flowery fanny pack and this big enough to put your camera in. You just take it everywhere you go. I've got that sling pack. So I may, I, I would wear that. It's more of a, a man purse type of uh, accessory. If you do go out and you're in a fanny pack and a speedo, we want picks. There will be zero <laughs> speedos in my suitcase. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and put that out there right now. That's solid, okay. solid piece of information. There will be zero speedos <laughs> <laughs> and zero pictures of yeah. me. In well, the... I might have to call one of your family Chris... members and and try to get them to. Yeah, I, mean, I think Heath could be stealthy. Christy, if you're listening, yeah, we want know. pics. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you can do behind the scenes. We're looking for a lot of hits on the website. Maybe that would drive traffic. That would drive traffic completely away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We better get to pro tips. Yeah. So that was the nice thing about action cameras, too, is you can pop them in the pocket. And yeah. no big deal. So for okay. video, for vlogging, love it. But I, I, am, I am curious about the GoPro 8. Yeah. It's a crazy trailer. thing paraglide so that should be a good test for the gopro 8 oh yeah because you're in the air and then you're going to land in the water yeah. do the full yeah. submerge submersion hopefully do you have that head uh what is it the the thing that you put on a helmet or your head to put the gopro on that'd be that'd I've, be a I've cool pov the, the mounts yep all right who's up yeah, who's got the Mark, you start us off. Well, I'm just going to spin on the same subject then about these action cameras and just to be careful with the settings on them because we it was live and learn in the field using these new pieces of equipment. And how crazy is it? I mean, it's so exciting in many ways, the speed at which technology is changing in our field, in our profession right now, whether you're an amateur or professional whether it's DSLRs, whether it's video, whether it's action cameras, it's dizzying how quickly this new gear is coming out. So, you know, I like to pick a, an item and, and be content with it for a piece, uh, a long segment of time. So the DJI Osmo Action, I've really enjoyed shooting it, but now with this GoPro 8's out, it's like, what's that about? So my point is that's... It's crazy what's going on in our world, but it's also exciting with, with the amount of gear that's coming out every... Like, when was the GoPro 7? How long ago? It wasn't that long ago that it's came only out. a couple of years ago, yeah. Was it I a couple think, of years? It, I don't think maybe, it was that Maybe long. it was only a year. Yeah, it, it hasn't been very long. When you get this new equipment, so some of it's irresistible, and these action cams, because of the evolution, so quick to improve each... Each generation seems to have a significant step up on the previous. It's hard to resist for those of us, especially into vlogging and storytelling. Not You have to be curious about what the new technology offers. And then, of course, if it's a big step up, you go for it because it's not as expensive as buying a new camera setup. You know, you're talking $500 Canadian. I think they're 350 U.S. ballpark, these action cams. Is that about right? Yeah. 400 so, for the eight, I think. And then it's a matter of of learning it and testing it in the field, what it's capable of, you know, as far as how you can submerse it and the menus, the operating systems. So live and learn on our trips with this. The Osmo Action I really like. I like the menu system a lot, the swipe on the back, the touch screen, the adjustments you can make. But I handed it off to my daughter or to my wife at times to go and do shoots because they were going to do something that at a different time than I was. They were going to go swim with dolphins and I wasn't on that part of the trip or something. And 
things got changed because they didn't know the settings and what to look for. So we all got schooled on it within a few days of this. But so one of the trips, unfortunately, with the dolphins, the first of three uh, dolphin experiences, the camera got switched somehow on the back to like 720, uh, oh. not even HD, from 4K to 720. And we were so excited about the encounter that it happened, but the footage, you know, is not usable for most applications. It was really disappointing. So watching and being aware of that, and on this action camera, it is displayed on the back of the screen when you're recording. So you can look at it and, and confirm, you know, you're at 4K 30 or 4K 60 or whatever your desired setting is. But to be aware of that, and, you know, I handed it off just expecting to hit record and stop, record and stop. And obviously, there's so much going on when somebody's swimming with dolphins and they've got their wetsuit and all their other gear and their mask and their snorkel. Somehow the back got swiped and the settings got changed. So it's important to pay attention to these details on the cameras. And the other thing that happened, this was funny, and I don't know how, the screen got flipped. So for a whole day of shooting, everything was upside down. Not a big deal. On the screen, when we play it on our, on our desktop or laptop, you can flip it back. You know, I've airdropped them to an iPad for mobile presentation, and you can edit it and flip it. But it's some another step you have to go through. How that happened, I have no clue. But everything was filmed upside down. So, so did we you find while you were at, while you were out in the field, did you find it's easier to do it from your phone to change the settings, or did you just go through the menus and change I things had, that way? I did go through the phone to switch the flip back mm -hmm. to to um, to the variable. So no matter which way you hold the camera, it'll be upside right, not upside down, if that makes sense. As far as the settings of the switching it back to 4K, I did it with the swipe on the menu. Okay. And it's all there. It, it was just a matter of, you know, you swipe right, you swipe left, you swipe up, you swipe down, all do different things on the back of the camera. So my point and pro tip with this is, and we've talked about this with other gear before, is when you get these new pieces of equipment, you have such tremendous potential for video for high quality. I love how these look on the television and on the iMac. Fantastic reproductions. But play with it. Get dialed in. And if you hand it off to somebody else, make sure you take 10 minutes and explain the settings, explain how you set things up and how you can change things if it gets thrown off. But just to be aware of, you know, I made sure to say, well, make sure the red light's flashing on top so you know it's recording. You can look at the back. You can see the second timer going. You know what you're recording because that happens on these all the time. It's just like an iPhone or a smartphone where you hit record on a video. There's so much excitement with, an, with wildlife interactions. It's happened to me where I thought I was recording, but I hit it twice, and I'm not. I missed it, right? And that can happen. So the first thing, you know, I was instructing them to make sure the red light's flashing or you can see the second count counter going on the back you know you're collecting data you're filming it but i didn't know enough to say watch and make sure that 4k i mean what are the odds of that changing so that got changed the screen got flipped you know so the one shoot wasn't salvageable it was all 720 everything else after that was live and learn but my point is to learn your equipment all these new devices when you get them play with them for enough time before you go into the field with them for the settings because they all have minor differences and if you're going to share the equipment with someone else make sure that they're up to speed on all these settings and how they can adjust it and keep checking on it themselves as well i thought it was just press and play it would be that easy right for them and it, it was it was except that these settings got changed so that's my first pro tip is is to know the equipment but not only that but make sure you when you share it with friends or family members and they're collecting footage for you make sure they know how to change the settings and what to look for well, that's a good. That's a timely one for me because that's that's definitely important that we're making sure we're getting what we think we're getting. Well, why was a seven twenty? Who wants him? Why do they even have a? I'm, I'm not criticizing the company, but why is there a seven twenty setting on it? Who films in that? Even you know HD because you anyway. <laughs> it shouldn't be able to drop to seven twenty. If it would drop to HD, it would have been okay. That's still fine for vlogging. Well, the thing to do with that is just to lock the screen on the back. You just need to lock it so it can't be, you know, you set it the way you want it, lock it. And then, you know, because they are persnickety. If you barely touch that thing and it's active, you know, and then once it's been activated, all you have to do, the palm of your hand can hit something. And then all of a sudden it's, 
you know, something's going crazy on it. So lock the screen if you're going to give it to somebody that's not totally familiar with it. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. I don't know how to do that. I'll figure that out later. <laughs> <laughs> See? Well, that's the other thing. It's menu. I mean, there's every camera you pick up has got 70,000 bells and whistles, and it's just a, it's hard to know them all. Yeah. But when you get it, ah, right? I mean, the, it's fantastic. I can't believe these little devices, how powerful they are now. Yeah. I love watching, you know, and everybody gets a thrill out of seeing these dolphins or sea turtles or schools of fish swimming this way and that. You know, the camera did a great job for something that is so small. Yep. You know, tie it to your hand somehow or have a floaty on it. I made sure to do that because I didn't snorkeling in 40 feet of water. If I dropped it, it was going to cause a problem down in the coral. So that was another yeah. thing for safety. Yeah, I definitely made sure that all the attachments and, and the floaty is in the bag. <laughs> yeah, even with the floaty, it's submersible. So it's good. It just means right. if you let go, it, it comes to the surface, right? Yeah. Yep. All right, Michael, what do you got? On that same line with the little action cameras a lot of the problems that i have is how do you you know if you're trying to get that really cool shot and a lot of times you're not holding it you're either strapping it to a tree or you're setting it in water if you're setting it in water you gotta you're dealing with current you're dealing with all these things well when i was up working with ray a couple of weeks ago he's whipping out this little thing called the platypod have you guys seen this yeah I was like, I've seen them, but I didn't really think about it. And then he had one. And, he, and they make two of them. There's a, a one's called Platypod Ultra, and I, don't, I think the other one's called the Platypod Max. Anyway, I saw what he had, so I bought one. And I'm like, yeah, this is probably the ticket. So here it is. So anybody watching on YouTube, you can see the little packaging here. I actually haven't used it yet, but we did play around with his a little bit. So essentially all it is is a piece of machined aluminum that's flat with all kinds of different mounting points on it so you can put it's got a 3 8 inch thread on the bottom so you can take a little itty bitty ball head like what i'm showing here you can screw it to it and then you've got a flat surface that you can set and it's got some heft to it so it would probably you know mark last year we were putting that camera in the water with those fish but the current was so swift that you, we had to figure out a way to put a rock on it or something to, to, so it would sit in that current. And this probably would get carried away in that current, but by the time you had the ball head and the camera, I think you'd be okay. And then the ball head's cool because then you can, you can get your horizon where you want it. The other thing about this thing is it gets you lower to the ground, so it's like a ground pod too. So some of those... Ray was using it where he was trying to get shots of the sun setting over the ocean on Turnigan Arm. And to do that with just water and the sunset, he was having to get right on the edge of the water. Well, where do you set a camera? You know, it's all rocky, a rocky coastline. And he finally just started using this and he would find a rock that was somewhat, you know, level. And then he just set that on the, and this was all submerged in the water, but it, his camera was up enough where he could shoot water right on the horizon with this cool sunset if you look at his instagram page you'll see a lot of those images so it's pretty cool the other thing it has if you look at it here it's got some uh slots in it so you can actually run a webbing through here and then you could go around a tree so you could mount it to a pole or a tree so it's sitting like this and then your ball head would be out here and then you could make all your adjustments so um this platypod it's kind of a cool little thing for the action cameras, and it's light. I mean, you throw it in your pack, it's not like it's going to add a ton of weight. The, net, the the bigger version is a little bit little bit more heft to it, and the bigger version would be fine for a DSLR. You know, this one, I don't know if I, you know, maybe you could get away with a little point-and-shoot or a little mirrorless, but I wouldn't probably, the, even that Sony mirrorless with the with the big lens on it, like a 24-70, to 70, the 2.8, I think that would be too heavy for this little guy. But for the action cameras, this is awesome. But I think it's going to come in handy. You know, and it's like I said, it's small enough that I can have it in my pack all the time. And then if the situation comes up, you're ready to go. What's awesome. it cost? Oh, geez. 
I think it was like forty bucks. Okay, and I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna look while cool. you guys do this. I'm gonna look and see because that's not right. But while you guys do the next one, I'll look and see. the The bigger one is like a hundred bucks, but this one was fairly cheap. The bigger one makes a good um, platform, like on a, a float tube, if you're in the water. Like after, you know, water birds or something like that, the waterfowl. Um, it makes a great platform just on the edge of a float tube, and you can have your ball head on there for a little bit more support. So there's another use for that. So the Platypod Max is 99 bucks, and then the Platypod, this one that I have, is 59 So. And where did you source that on? These I just fine? got it from Amazon, so we'll put a link okay. on uh on our cool. show notes, but I think it's a, it's something you definitely would want. And you're, you know, we were using those little clips, remember mm-hmm. Mark? And it was Sean that had it. And then once we found out, so I have one of those in my pack, but I think this is even a little bit better just cause it's a little bit more heft to it. It would have been perfect for you on the, when you were shooting those caribou walking by your camera. Yeah, no, it, it, it's flat. So, you know, it doesn't take up space in your pack. I like that about it. Yeah. And with these action cameras, whatever, whatever brand you're shooting, you know, all these accessories, there should be two or three or four accessories that you have that you carry to facilitate some of these cool perspectives that you can get with these cameras. So that's a good one because it's flat. You know, I like the little flexible tripod for some situations and then the clamp that you can, the big clamp arm with, with the rotating uh, mount arm on it that you can attach to trees and such to yeah. anything like that so i want the caribou i tried i got the caribou from the low perspective but also there were game trails that had vegetation about three or four feet up and i put the the action camera mounted to the tree to get them coming by at that viewpoint point of view pov mm-hmm. as well right so there's yeah you want to have that ability to to mount in different perspectives for the sake of when you create a blog you've got more than one viewpoint to show yep makes it much more dynamic yep. so these tools are, are important to, to have and, and of course the more packable they are the better i have a spike one too that flips into itself and then you unscrew and the spike comes out and it's twice the height and that way if the veget if the ground's not frozen or if there's snow you can just walk along and plant the thing and it just spikes in but the thing with that is you do have to take a second and watch your horizon right yeah i give that set up every time but if so you're shooting in 4K and then you're just exporting it out in HD, you can always fix your horizon in post. So just know that. That's that's. I'm, I'm going to spin onto that pro tip, but it's not my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stick with the low perspective and not for a different reason that we usually talk about. We talk about getting eye level with the subject. We talk about, you know, giving your subject power in your image, and that's why you want to be as low as you can be. Um, but the one that I'm going to throw out there is just, so there will be a lot of times where you're out photographing and you may have birds on a fence or birds on a a dog house or a, a tree that has some human elements on it. Getting low sometimes gives you the opportunity to utilize the foreground to get rid of some of those human elements. And so you just be creative in your composition. Uh, but you know, I see a lot of, people utilize this technique with snow and the other thing that this does is it adds a little bit of depth to the to your image so people have that you know 3d effect through the image so you get low enough that you've got a little bit of snow in the bottom of your frame and if you're shooting at a shallow depth of field or shallow aperture what happens is it it blurs out that foreground and then it gives that depth to where your subject is and then depending on your aperture of course you're getting rid of the the background also so you isolate your subject you can utilize it the the same technique to get rid of you know distracting foreground elements and we you know we we talk about it in other aspects all the time but this is just another one as far as getting low and and those different perspectives this is just another advantage that you can take or that you can utilize to make your images stand out and make your images a little bit different. There's thousands of good photographers out there. So you've got to find a way to separate yourself. And it's a definitely a technique that can be overdone in my opinion. I mean, some people I see, they do it every image that they have. 
and I think it can be overdone. But when it's done correctly, I think it does make your image stand out a little bit, separate it from the crowd. A good example of that would be Jamin. Yep. So we'll put a link to his Instagram account if you want to go see some of that. Because he, he does a lot of birds, right? He's like a mm -hmm. pretty awesome bird photographer. So I think looking at his Instagram feed would give you some ideas. And Jerry Herod had a, a moose in snow very much like that, did he not, yeah. recently? That, that was one of the he's first had, I noticed. He's had with. several. He's been working with that, playing with that quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, I really liked how he handled that. It was just a different perspective. And again, when you create an image like that with that blurred foreground, I mean, it just diversifies one's portfolio to have that stuff as well, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, Isaac Spots does it really well as well. I mean, there's there's a lot of people that utilize it, but those are some great examples. Yeah. Good job. All right, Mark, you said you were going to spin on to something. Is that next or you got something else? Sure. Sure, let's do that. Well, I'm thinking about it before it escapes my mind. So as far as horizons, being able to affect that or change that in video, I mean, that's not something I've got to, I'm so looking forward to having the time to learn more video editing. So I'm glad that you can do that. You have, but Michael, you have to drop it from 4K to HD in order to make that happen. Right. Well, it's just like whenever you're correcting the horizon in a, on a still right. image, you know how you lose part of your image. You, okay. You, you know, you're just going to lose that same thing on video. So in video, a lot of times people will use an image stabilization uh, post-production effect to stabilize video. So you, you watch regular television and if there's shaky footage, it's intended to be shaky. If they're shooting it and it's shaky, a lot of times they fix that in post. So they'll shoot it in 4K. But everything we're watching on TV, most things that we watch on TV nowadays is output in 2K or HD, right? So if you shoot in 4K, then you've got an extra two, you know, extra pixels around that image. And the software will go in and, and stabilize your image using that extra space to, to make it happen. So 8K is huge right now as far as that. That's why Hollywood, Stop. that's why Stop. Hollywood's using Too 8K. Big is because they can go Too down to money. 4K and still have 8K, you know, 8K worth of information to, to then stabilize later. So, yeah, I mean, it's anything you can do with the still, you can pretty much do with video in your post-processing. The biggest thing is you need a ton of horsepower, which means you need to buy that new Mac Pro at 40000 bucks. You need to buy it, and then I'll <laughs> yeah. send you my, and send share you my it footage. Share <laughs> Okay, so my with the horizon is is what I was going to focus on for this pro tip. So it's in, that was information for me as far as the video being capable of making that adjustment. And if in the perfect world, yeah, if, if you can shoot in 8K and then fix the horizon to 4K, sweet. But HD works too. So many still photographers have great stabilized lenses, but they're still anchored on tripods. Now tripods are great because it gives you time to think about what you're going to compose. The horizon is a big element of that. You're on your tripod, you're set up, you level the horizon. Let's just assume that there isn't an animal that's running past and you've missed your shot. You've got time to set that up. But with so much wildlife photography, we, you know, you miss the shot by taking that time on a tripod. I don't use a tripod for stills for wildlife at all, anymore, ever. That does compromise the horizon at times. I'm running around taking the pictures you know, most of the time I get the horizon straight, but there's a percentage that I'll get back. I'll up, download the images. I've got them on the desktop and it's like, whoa, that's wonky. Those trees are at an angle. The horizon's at an angle, but you can fix that in post. So my pro tip is it's worth, worth that sacrifice of having the horizon off a bit in order to get the image. The image is still sharp. Everything's still great about it. The composition's there. It's just tilted a bit because it's handheld. But we can easily fix that in post. There's so many tools that can do it. Photoshop, it's easy to do it. And you just adjust the horizon, you crop it, and you're done. And it's perfect. And you didn't miss the shot because you're on a tripod. So something to think about in the field, that versatility allows you to capture more images and get that moment. Be fast. I mean, that's the challenge of wildlife photography. Knowing the equipment, being fast when something spectacular is happening, there's that rare moment to try and capture it. Obviously, you can't get it all the time, but not having the tripod can really make that difference. Fixing the horizon later is no stress, especially, spin onto this, the larger megapixel cameras now. 
So the D850, and there's so many cameras that are coming out that are fully capable of great wildlife photography speed. The fact that you have a 45 or 46 megapixel sensor, you're not losing anything as far as reproduction by adjusting the horizon and doing that minor crop. I'm going to do a double, I'm going into a double tip here. Since I'm in editing, can I do that? Am I allowed? Yeah. <laughs> Easy, Tiger. <laughs> Since this is a big editing season for me, something that I'm really enjoying about, again, the larger megapixel camera sensors is the crop factor in post that still creates an image that's bigger than the previous pro cameras, the D4S I had. I can crop a horizontal, vertical. You know, the different markets want different presentations. So I've shot the image maybe in a horizontal, but when I crop a vertical, all of a sudden it's going to fit a different market have far more appeal and still be a bigger file size than the D4S. I love that flexibility that we can do in post now as well. So another teaser for those of you that are thinking about a larger megapixel camera, shop around, but I am really enjoying that part of modern camera technology to have that flexibility in post to just, even though image number one was the way I wanted it to be in, co in composition, I can create a whole second portfolio by adjusting those parameters that the dimensions, the the cropping of that image for a different market. And it, it truly has a different feel. There may be a whole bunch of trees out of focus on the right side of a horizontal and the animals on the left. All of a sudden I crop it vertical. It's a very different image. It's a clean image of the animal. Two different applications. You know, one's a two page spread for something. Another one is for a cover and it works both ways out of one image. So much fun. It takes more time at the computer, but it's fun. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you wanted a lot of magnification, right? Because you had to try to zoom in on that animal. Now you can zoom by cropping. But then if your horizon's off, you don't want to be super tight either. Because then the minute you fix that horizon, then you're chopping the animal's legs off or something. So mm. being backed off a little bit is probably what you want, just so you have room to make that crop. So if you feel like you're going to be, if you're running a gun and you're just shooting and you're like, ah, I think this is close, but I'm just going to shoot it just because I don't have time to, to fix it then you know that you can fix it in post, but just allow a little bit extra room so that you have the ability to make that adjustment. That's awesome. Yep, that's, that's wise, for sure. Good add-on. And uh, you think about that, again, with these large megapixels. Yeah, back it off a bit gives that flexibility if you have that uncertainty. Yeah. Yep. Well said, man. All right. Michael? Rather than do a piece of equipment, I'm going to throw out a little... This isn't necessarily a pro tip, as much as it is just an inspirational tip. So yesterday I was, like I said, I was researching all this podcast stuff. So I was on YouTube all day long trying to figure out all these little pieces of software. Somehow along the way, I mean, I, I watch YouTube a lot, right? So I, at some point, I, every time I run across anything in wildlife, I'll check it out. Most of the YouTube wildlife stuff is not that great, right? It's a lot of work to get her something that's really good, BBC quality or whatever. So a lot of times I'll start it and then I'm like, nah, it's, it's, it's not what I want. Well, I started one the other day and, and I must have got onto something else. So it was still queued up in my YouTube feed. I know Mark, in our Wild and Exposed, we follow this, this guy. His name is Morton Hilmer. Do you, are you guys familiar with this guy? Yeah, I was just watching him this morning, actually. Were you? Well, I was watching. He did a thing up on Ellesmere Island looking for the white wolves. It's pretty cool. I mean, this guy did a lot of work. I mean, knowing what goes into video production and knowing what, how he, what he did, he spent, I don't even know, it was three or four or five weeks on Ellesmere Island. Look, he was with another dude, and they were looking for um, white wolves. And But it's super hard. I mean, they were up there in March, which means it's, constant snow but the days are getting longer and and um it was just a it's pretty inspirational little piece to watch so i would just say check it out we'll put a link in the show notes to that actual piece that i watched but um it's just cool to see what people are out there doing and you just i mean there's cool stuff to do in your backyard but man the expedition adventure potential is huge with the stuff that we do and that's a great example of adventure Arctic wolves would be incredible. I mean, I, I, they're, from my understanding, not afraid of people whatsoever because they don't see people. But it's a matter of knowing where they are and then, you know, handling the situation properly to document it. But how much fun would that be? Sign yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I was watching. And they're it. a wolf, so they travel at a pretty good clip when they travel. I mean, if you yeah, find you... a den set up something like that, you're good. But if they're following a herd, it's going to be tough to keep up with them. So they are definitely a challenge. And mad props to the people that have, like him, that have filmed them successfully. Yeah, and he when didn't they... have great luck. I mean, he didn't. Let, it wasn't like he got a pack of wolves. I mean, he got one wolf sporadically. He actually. I don't know how they coordinated this whole... I think he would be an awesome guest on our podcast, and I think we'll work towards getting him on just to talk a little bit about that adventure and how he set it up. But they were based out of some remote cabin somewhere, a research cabin that they must have set up through some adventure company or something. And then he spike camped out of there in a tent to, to try to capture these wolves. And it's just a... Just me, I guess maybe what my interest was is knowing what goes into video production and what it takes to tell a good story and have all those shots and the time that it takes. I mean, Sean was a good example of that. I mean, you see this finished product and it looks great, but you have no idea how much time it goes into setting up cameras. And, you know, everything you do takes twice as long because you got to get the shot, the video shot. And if you're doing it all on your own, it's, it's a monumental task and he did it really well. So I think it's just a good That's example. That's Sean, Sean James, and people can go back and find our fun podcast with him from last summer, too. But, you know, I'd like to encourage people to watch these clips. Watch it once for the pure enjoyment, and then watch it a second time and just watch the clip changes and the perspectives and, and think about building it. And it's a whole other um, mental, well, the process behind it, like you're saying, right? So yeah. you can enjoy it, but yeah, to sit from an editor's point of view and, and think about the production is uh, is a, for those that in the video. I'm I'm getting tongue tied here. It's worth doing. It makes a big difference when you watch a show thinking about that side of it. And it even works for stills too, because if you're going to do a behind the scenes still story that for Facebook or for Instagram or for a, an article in a magazine all these behind the scene images really play into that putting people right where you were at. And I know that it's a lot of work and I get out there a lot of times thinking, Oh, I'm going to do this and this and this. And then I get about a third of it done because it's just, there's so much to go into it. So anyway, we'll put a link in the show notes and hopefully we can get him. I think he's Danish. I think. So I would love to, to get him on the podcast and just talk about that expedition. Okay, I'm going to go back to what you said about leaving some space in your image so that and and then cropping in post. Before it's I mean before these high megapixel megapixel cameras the philosophy was get everything right in camera and you still want to do that as much as possible. And that included doing your cropping in camera. So as you're composing, you know, make try to get the image that you want to have as a final product in camera so you maximize the the potential size of that file and quality of that file. And going back to what you said, Michael, about having this potential, um, what you guys were tying into with the, the high megapixel sensors, negative space is something that's not necessarily utilized as much. I see, I look at a lot of people's images and most people are, they're trying to get that full frame headshot of an animal and in the process of doing that you end up cutting off limbs you end up cutting off body parts and and there are times for that of course um but leave some negative space in your image somewhere for that animal to look into to travel into or in the case of you know it's it's winter time right now so you've got animals that are walking through snow you might have negative space behind them but it tells a little bit more of the story because you're seeing the tracks of where that animal traveled from, the tracks lead up to the animal, and then it, you know, you can show the the country or the the habitat that that animal's going into. So leaving a little bit of negative space, I think it'll make your images pop. And again, you know, as we've talked about in the past, you want to completely work that scenario, but make sure as part of it, you know, you want your tight shots, you want your environmental shots. Make sure as part of it, though, you think about that negative space and where it best helps you to or complements the remainder of the story, complements that image so you can tell the rest of the story. I like that. I mean, that the video I was just referring to, uh, he did a great job of that. And, and 
one way to force yourself into that is if you only have one subject to shoot, then you're forced to try to think about all these different ways to shoot it. Cause you can get all the tight, close portrait shots you want. Right. But if you're going to try to set yourself apart or if all you got is time in one subject, then yeah, play around and, and try those different things. Yeah. Mark mentions that a lot, you know, work and work in the subject. And that's exactly what he means. You know, get it from every perspective, vertical, horizontal, tight, open, you know, that, and that's the other advantage to having a zoom rather than a, a fixed focal length telephoto. You can still do it, but you gotta, you gotta zoom with your feet in or out. You gotta create space. And sometimes that's not always possible with wildlife because you can end up pushing them or spooking them. So having that zoom range for, with your, with your camera is going to give you that potential. And, and uh, backlighting and silhouetting is fun to do when those opportunities present themselves. And for me, one of my favorite situations. Stop. Where... <laughs> that's, that's later. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to elaborate because most wildlife situations, you're very limited with time, what you can work. But one of my favorites that fits this mold is spending a whole day walking with caribou because then you have the time to work the different angles, to try tight shots. They get used to the people caribou do that right after a while. And you can work the different elements of the environment in from close ups to environmental portraits. But it's not often we have a wildlife subject that that is that tolerant that we can move around and work different sides. But there are those out there, you know, and, see a lot of fox images on social media. Obviously, there are places where there are habituated foxes that live near urban areas or something, and they're predictable, and you have the chance to work different angles. Then it makes sense to do that stuff for sure. And it's the challenge of photography. Is it diversifying that dynamic portfolio that we all strive to have for any species, any niche that we try to, to capture and, and spend time with? All right, Mark, you're next. It's my turn. All right, I'm going, I'm going off on a different subject here. I'm going to just quickly touch on some pointers on social media for Instagram growth. I know we've talked about this. Uh, I need to hear this. A couple of years. <laughs> well, a couple of things I found out recently, discovered. First and foremost, and for those of you that have, have a significant account, this is relevant that I didn't realize the potential of the profile visits in the last seven days. You see that stat at the top of your page. Profile visits, the number of people that have gone and looked at your profile in the last seven days. And it's updated all the time whenever you refresh kind of thing. I was off the radar for the most part for the Australia-New Zealand trip. And then some of my trips this fall, I unplugged from social media for days at a time. because I was just in the wilderness, didn't have cell access. And, and there are times I just want my head to be where I'm at in present tense. That dropped my numbers because I may have only posted twice a week. And I went down to maybe 400 profile visits in the past seven days. Lately, I'm back to consistent posting an image a day, highlight days on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, holidays. I try to do two posts a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. It's back up to over, when it hit 1,000 profile visits in the last seven days, everything just jumped. The number of followers I got skyrocketed over the every 24 hour period compared to lower than a thousand profile visits in the last seven days. So that was something obviously in their current algorithm that made a change, got more, um, every image was showed to more viewers and got more returns. So instead of getting 10 followers overnight, I'd wake up and have 60 or 70 followers overnight, new ones. So that changed it. So, so now, being aware of that, at least with the current algorithm, I'm making sure to post each day so that it stays over a thousand or keeps growing. It's at 1500 now. If it gets, who knows what happens if it's 2000? I don't know. But all these I thresholds. I think they send you a popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> well, excuse me. <clears throat> we could go there. I mean, yeah. The whole relevance of social media is another conversation and how to, how, you know, what profit potential comes out of it. But for those that want to keep growing their profile, that was one thing I really noticed over the past few months is when I took a break and it dropped below that, it really slowed down my traction. When I got above a thousand profile visits, it took off. That's good to know. So, I mean, that's crazy that, I mean, and it takes those, 
be in a way to kind of figure that stuff out too, right? Do you think you would have figured that out if you wouldn't have like dropped off? No, because it would have just kept trucking along. And right. I didn't, you know, I expected it to slow down because I wasn't posting as much, but I didn't, I didn't really anticipate the amount of um, throttling back that, that really happened. For the current size of my account, I thought, you know, when I got back on and after a week of posting every day, it'd be back to normal. It took weeks, like three weeks of posting every day before the Instagram algorithm was happy with me again. I was like, come on. But that's it took that to get back in stride. So I have a few other pointers, too, for people who care and want to grow their Instagram account some tips on how to do that because I've had some other photographer friends, really talented talk photographers just get on it recently and been asking me questions through direct message and stuff. And so I just want to put a few of these things out there. One fellow just had his, um, Milo Bircham, great photographer from Alaska, had some of his stuff being reposted and was curious about why that was happening and what to do about that. And of course it depends on what you, what you want, whether you care if it's reposted, but fundamentally my, preferences are to make sure that my images are as low res as possible to still look good on the screen 72 dpi um really i get away with you know three four five hundred um kilobyte images i think that's right anyway quite small and i watermark using that we talked about this before the watermark app there are two versions the blue download the yellow download that each cost a few bucks no big deal but they're very versatile the yellow allows you to do still photos and video watermarking the blue is only photos and is a little bit cheaper both work well i have i have both i had the blue first and with video added the yellow watermark the image where it's not right on the bottom that can be easily cropped and still look like a great image i you know it's it's Opa opacity is reduced somewhat so it's not blatantly obvious it's subtle but it's there where if it was cropped into the image it compromises the animal so that will reduce the amount of reposting of course it's a big world out there and there are all kinds of people who have different understandings and perspectives or don't care and, and will repost and it's a matter of either asking them if you want to take it down or blocking them if it's something they've done without permission but I put that right in my bio, as most people do with experiences, you know, ask permission before reposting. And that's so that's just something to watch. The daily consistency for growth is is relevant from what I've seen. Keywording is important, you know, picking a variety of keywords, shaking them up, each post having different keywords. You can use some of the same, but move them around so it's not all similar and big keywords that have a lot of followers as well as more specific ones just for that image that will smaller following on a keyword will keep the image visible longer for those people who look to those keywords compared to like photo of the day you know you've got a chance to hit a huge number of views in a millisecond then your image is gone because of the number of people that use that hashtag that keyword that hashtag so it's a matter of mixing up some popular hashtags or keywords and some that aren't the timing's important the time of day you think about it when do you look at your social media when do you watch people looking at social media when are people taking a break from their schedule and are hooking up with looking at these these platforms that's when you want to be posting so you know i don't post at dinner time you have to take into account you shake it up globally to the different time zones but i post early evening because people are you know they're not at work they've had dinner they might be watching TV and you know how most people they pick up their their smartphone and they're looking at images too. So that seems to be a good time for traction. So something to think about interacting with other people on social media, other pages that you like, compliment their work. It's it's a social community that feeds back onto itself. They'll compliment your work. The more comments that you get on posts, the better traction they have. And I we've talked on this before. I haven't heard any stats on current algorithms, but you know, four words or longer, the more complex a comment is, the better it will do for that person. So, but any comment, they all add up. So doing that interacts with people and the interaction reinforces the traction on social media from what I've seen. So, and I reply to comments. People have been nice about, you know, taking the time to like a picture. It can just be a like you comment back, you hit that little heart, you can do that right in the likes column now you don't have to go to your page that's to me mandatory but that's still kind of shallow 
in a sense. I mean, I do appreciate it. I like the fact that they made a comment, so I like it back. But to really grow it, I find that it's important to comment back too. So I do that too. And post good work. You know, I'll admit it. I don't post my very often my super duper favorite secret ninja images that Michael talks about. But they have to be good because you want to build a client base, not just a social media following. But if you're interested in selling images, they have to appeal. So there's no point, in my opinion, of putting up images that would compromise the reputation of one's body of work. So high quality images as far as what the image looks like. A low resolution version, for sure. But good images make a difference for impact as well. So, yeah, anyway, I've held some back, but I'm... At a certain point, I'm really looking forward to testing the potential of social media and Instagram where I'm going to want to put out some of these highlight images. I mean, they're all high. They have to be good enough that they draw people's attention, but I want to promote them through some sales and see what happens. I, and I'm hopeful because of three years of work on Instagram and building a following that there will be success that way. There have been successes. I get print orders and stuff that just come out of the blue, which is fantastic. Thank you for that when that happens. And I'm honored that you want it on your wall. But to do something more specific where, you know, I'm going to print 20 of these canvases, first come, first serve at this discount price because I did 20 at once kind of thing and just see if it happens overnight. That's what I'm hoping for because it's been a lot of work. But it's fun to do too. So these are all different points and tips that I've kind of refined on Instagram over the years and where I'm at right now with strategy just to share with you folks that are either in it at the moment or are thinking about getting into social media and Instagram. You know, I was going to say some stuff about that, but, and then I wasn't, but now that you brought it up, I think I'll bring up something that happened to me. I've fallen off. I don't do the post today. I I'm lucky to get two up a week. And I, it goes up and down, and sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. And then I, I, I know how much time it takes to, you know, the amount of time to do a really good post is, you know, 15, 20 minutes, right? To, to process the image, write a, a nice caption, and then do your keywords. And so I'm constantly, like, on this pendulum of, okay, yeah, let's do it. Oh, no, I'm done with it. Oh, yeah, let's do it. You know, I guess my point is I haven't been doing it a lot. And, of course, my account doesn't grow that. It grows, but it doesn't grow by that much. The other day I put up an image, and I don't know what happened to it. It must have got on, like, an Instagram something because it went to well over 7,000 likes. How does that happen? What, what did I do? I really haven't went back to look at hashtags to see if there was one that I don't use that may have caught fire, or I guess I'm just asking you, is there any insight into how that happens and what, you know, it's happened a couple of times with a couple of different images, but this one, it, I put it up probably three weeks ago and it still will get 50 to a hundred likes overnight. But what, ha what, what did I do? I don't get it. I don't know what the magic little, I mean, it can't be an algorithm thing because it's just another image, right? I wish it was more transparent. It's, it's so hard to figure out. It's like a riddle. And, there are times I, I've felt that if you go quiet, and this didn't work when I was on these trips. I mean, we all need breaks from this stuff at, at times. But when traveling, you know, I went quiet on it compared to normal. And there have been other times where it hasn't been three weeks of quiet, but maybe a week or so. And when I put something up, it got traction. It's almost like Instagram was like, come on back and we're going to reward you because you put this post up. That's all guesswork. I have no idea why they change algorithms, why they play these games, and and and, but it, that does happen, you know. And why certain images go? Obviously, they they get traction and they get on multiple keywords, and and for some reason they leave them near the top, and more and more people see them. But why they decided that image? And it's it's the same for me. I mean, there was a caribou a week ago that's still getting hits. And I don't want to bury it because it's still by putting up too many new posts, but you have to keep moving and it will die off when you bury it that way. But why did that caribou go nuts compared to the other caribou or elk? Or And there's no way to go look, right? Because I was like, oh, I wonder if I could go look at the search bar and see if it, you know, you know, that little search function when you want to just discover new work. 
right. you know, sometimes I'll go there. I'm wondering, well, maybe it got there, but I, I don't know how I would ever know if it got there. If you hit your keywords, so what was the image of again? A moose. Okay, so moose would be one of your keywords, probably. Your hashtag. Oh, so you're saying look at that hashtag and see if it comes up on that. Right. So I've oh. done that where I, you know, I had a, a couple of whitetail bucks in the snowy woods this past week. It had decent traction. I hit the deer or whitetail hashtag, and it was the top one, and it was like 1.6 million posts on that hashtag. So for 24 hours, it was the or, or a period of time, let's say, it was the top one. So if anybody looked up deer or whitetail, that's the first image on that page that they'd see. So chances are that your moose uh, on a few of those hashtags stayed right at the top for an extended period. But the question that remains unanswered is why? Is it because you were quiet for a bit and Instagram's like, this guy's been around for a while, he just posted again, some kind of automatic algorithms like keep it up there so he feels reward. Clearly, they all want us to be on on it as the app as much as possible because it feeds into their, yeah. into their advertising and their revenue and their success. Right. right? So, right. huh? Well, I don't know. I'll have to do a little bit more because it's still, I mean, it was like you said, three weeks ago and it's still gaining. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it, it just is crazy, but whatever. I, I mean, like it's video. just something. The video was awesome. People have to go to your Instagram and look at your moose video, that big bowl. Well, thanks. That was fit. Yeah, yeah, I want to keep doing that. I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just convert my whole page to just video. But then you're looking, you know, take that 15 minutes per post to now two hours right. per post. And I'm like, I don't know if I can justify that kind of time to no, do it. No, that's, that's just it, right? We still don't have, I mean, maybe there are those people out there that have half a million followers and that are converting it to good revenue. Uh, but it's still not proven. And at what point does it become profitable in the trade off for time? I enjoy the interaction. I love seeing the images and learning about other destinations right. and seeing friends work. Uh, so Instagram has tremendous appeal for me that way. But man, the amount of time I've put into it for three years, I hope one of these days that it, it starts. I mean, it, it is making money, but not to the extent to justify the time whole heart, you know, flat out. It doesn't yet. When does that happen? be nice to know and hopefully it does right it, it's a lot of work for people it's it's fun but it's a lot of work it's time time well and everybody and, needs and, to know all of our listeners need to know that you do your account but you also do a huge portion of the wild and exposed account and it, our our account wouldn't be nowhere without you putting that so the amount of work you put in on yours but then you know maybe double it or i mean well you, let's thank god you do all that because that. we would be floundering if you didn't put in that kind of work. Yeah, but that's been, you know, I do that on and off too. And I, I mean, I really have a lot of passion behind our project, obviously. And Instagram and anything social media, we hope has relevance down the road. And, and that's, you know, when we put up a podcast, Missy finishes our hard work and comes up with a great edited podcast that we launch on Tuesdays. We put it up, Missy puts it up in the story. She's the best at making the stories. And I screen capture that and put it on my story with a direct link. That's one of the benefits of having over 10,000 followers. You put a direct link to our website and hopefully more and more people discover what we do. But our, our Instagram, Wild and Exposed Instagram page, you know, it does keep growing. And it's the same kind of thing where, you know, at what point does it become more powerful for us? But on that note, you guys... Throw your stuff in there whenever you no, want. No, I no, we want to. I no, I'm yeah, just saying. I'm shake it. I'm glad you up. do it because I just don't think about it. I just don't well, time. You know, if you're on the road for four weeks shooting commercial stuff, if you know, if you've got downtime and you want to just put your feet up and play on it, you do it. But it's it's on a consistent basis. It's hard to do when we're under the gun on other projects, right? We have deadlines and stuff, and there are times that it's just not feasible. So it makes sense. And, you know, I'm happy to do what I can, but never hesitate because when you guys put something crackerjack up on your own feet, I'm like, ah, tag it, put it on. You know, <laughs> I have been tagging a lot more. And I think I did see in, in comments on my page, wherever I tag wild and exposed, you right. know, people will say, oh, that was, you know, cool image. Oh, and I just finished listening to that podcast. Really like it, which is cool. You know that I think I need to do a lot more of that. And it's just, 
it's a mindset, man. It's just a mindset. And I think my new goal is is to get to that ten thousand so that I can do the the links. I think that's my think goal. And if I could hit that ten thousand then so all y'all please go follow my account. Uh-huh. <laughs> And wild and exposed. Get on our Instagram. <laughs> well, and for any of you out there, you think about it. When you hit 10,000, whether you're selling a print, whether you're selling a calendar, whether you're selling a book, you can provide a direct link to the checkout on whatever website or platform or retail outlet that's selling your product. That makes a difference. It's not just a story saying, hey, I've got this great book. It's like, here's a great book, but touch this and you can buy it and it's shipped to you right now. So there's a lot of incentive to get to that 10,000 for anybody who's interested in marketing their work. But when you post an image and you have more than one account, right when you before you hit share at the top right of the screen, there are these little toggles for each account, right? You guys know that. Mm-hmm. And you post, obviously, your main account's at the top. Then we have wild and exposed. If you slide the second toggle over, it posts both accounts simultaneously. I think that is a function of being over 10,000 because it won't let me do that. Oh, really? No, I can do post. that. I can you do can? that. You mm-hmm. can? I've tried and it says you can't post to one more than one account at a time. Oh, no kidding. Okay, then. Yeah. Well, well yeah, maybe that's, that's a... I'll keep trying that. I can do so that. So maybe a third of the time I do that just because of time constraints. I don't have time sure. to post, so I'll share it to both. You know, I prefer to do two because it's more diverse. But I find also when I share it to both, it doesn't compromise either post. You know, you have to wonder if it, it does that because it's the same keywords, it's the same image. Right. But they both they both seem to get consistent traction as per normal. So it's not a problem to do that. And whenever there's a time constraint, it's worth doing. So if you can, go for it. But it, I don't, I don't, yeah. Hey, I want to help um, one of our listeners out. She wants to get to a thousand and she put out a little thing on her Instagram and she's going to give away a print when she gets to a thousand to whoever that, I don't know how. Isn't it a metal print? Yeah. Right. And it's going to be a nice print. So I think all y'all should go out and follow MJ Mead Photography. M-J-M-E-A-D-E Photography. So I'm just going to keep friending and unfriending and friending and unfriending and friending and unfriending <laughs> until I get to be the thousand pound. <laughs> when she started that, she was like, I don't remember, but she's, uh, she's at like eight ninety nine now. So she needs 101 people to follow her. That was really good. I'm glad you did that, Mark. Cause that's a lot of good information. And you know, the thing is, is I think the photography business was thought of early on. It was very competitive, right? And it was so, like, hey, I'm not going to share this. I'm going to try to get it to the magazine before anybody else. And I'm I'm going to, you know, it, I think we had this thing where we were all buddies, but we all were kind of doing our own thing. Social media debunks all that, right? I mean, you want to support everybody as much as, you know, they're going to reciprocate, hopefully. And it just, it makes us all stronger. And there's no reason we all can't be it. 10,000 or 100,000 or whatever. It doesn't, I don't think that competition needs to be there in the social media aspect of things. We're just, you just want more people to see your work. You just want more people to see what we're doing. So if we all prop each other up, I think it's, it's good. There is, what is it, 7 billion people on this planet? And there's, you know, it, it's a huge potential marketplace out there. So yeah, there's def- definitely room to share. And it's, you know, it used to be websites, right? We still all have websites. They're far more detailed and, and a lot more things available through a website. But people don't go looking for websites anymore. They're on social media. If you want to be found, you know, I've been found by publishing clients around the globe. Different things come up because of social media. Instagram, for me, is the platform that supersedes my website. People find me on Instagram. Then they may hit the link and go to my website and see more of my portfolio that way. But it's Instagram. There's still... I think there's a lot more potential for discovery and even, you know, individual print orders, canvas orders, that kind of stuff. It's, it's through that far more often than old school websites. So yeah, it's, it's important to share. Yep. Michael, what do you got? I, can I throw one in? I did. It's a very quick one. I thought you just did like 35 of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Never mind. I'll wait. I'll wait. <laughs> 
All right, I just don't want to escape, <laughs> escape my head and my short-term memory issues. All right, <laughs> right, write, write, it down. write it down, write it down. Yeah, it's been down. Go ahead. All right, so I'm just going to piggyback on that uh, website thing. I think you're right. I think a lot of people don't visit websites as much as – well, it's just – it's a function of the phone, I think, right? It's just easier to scroll through Instagram. But what I did want to point out, and this isn't – this is a pro tip. What we're doing on the Wild and Exposed site is – we have the uh, page that has all the podcasts, but we also have a page that we're starting to build on, which is going to be a bunch of articles and uh, posts by other photographers, not necessarily us, although Ron has one up there now. But we're having other photographers that we work with write articles and provide images about something specific. So one of the ones that's going to go up here in the next week is Drew Hamilton. And I... Ron, do you know his Instagram right offhand? Yeah, I know it's... I will, I'll look it up so it, you go ahead. Okay. And look it but up. he did a really cool article on, you know, if you're using a straight up 400 millimeter lens and it's too much, think about stitching images together. So if you got a subject and you're too close, go ahead and take the shot. And if it's stationary, shoot above it, shoot it below it, shoot to the side, shoot all this stuff, and then come into post and stitch that image together. And oftentimes you get a much more compelling image well, obviously, you get a much more compelling image, but it's probably something you wouldn't have got being further away. It's articles like that that we're going to start putting up on the Wild and Exposed site that I think people will be interested in, in at least being exposed to it. You may not be interested in doing it, but I guess I'm just, it's a shameless plug to drive traffic to the website, but I think you're going to get something out of it. It's Drew HH is his Instagram handle. D R E W H H. And he's and a bear then, viewing photography guide in Alaska. Yeah. Uh, yeah, That's Alaska and, and Canada. I think he's oh, yeah, currently so, so in so Japan yeah, right now compared. doing stuff in Japan. So he gets yeah, all over the place. Uh, he, was, he was over in uh, Hokkaido uh, photographing the sea eagles, he said. Yeah, the stellar sea eagles. I saw that. Yeah. Ron, you've got one that's going to go up on, on understanding. A lot of the basics, uh, there's just so many things that we're going to start putting up there. And I think it's just going to foster. And hopefully Mark will have some time in his busy schedule because he's just a, he's a writer and, and can convey those ideas much better than, than I can. And I'd love to get some of that insight. And these are short. These Little are dude. just like 600 word articles with, with cool images to illustrate what's being talked about. Well, think about today's podcast. We've had a bunch of tips from all kinds of different vantage points of photography, and some are travel, some are philosophical. It'll be like that. It'll be all over the place, just these short snippets of ideas and how-tos and, and components that way. So how do people find it on, on the website, Michael, just to direct that way too? Yeah, so you just go to wildandexposed.com, and then once you're there, there's a link. There's a thing called What's Up. A link called what's up if you hit what's up that'll basically take you to that blog page and we got quite a bit of stuff up there now um, the thing we did on salmon we put in some of our podcast posts from YouTube Mark and I did something this is from December 2018 so there's there's some stuff up there now but we're gonna really focus on trying to get some really relevant articles and and different things up there that I think our listeners will benefit from yeah and if you are a writer, reach out to us uh, if you've got a good idea, but we want to keep it to one topic. We've got several others that are that have things in the works, and we'll get those up soon. But don't be afraid to reach out. We'd love to, to diversify that content for sure. All right, I'm going to go ahead with, uh, I don't do equipment a lot, but most of the time when we do equipment, we're helping people spend money and I think this one will be helping people save it to an extent. Um, minimum focal distance is a problem when you're doing macro photography, and that's why people will carry a, a macro lens. And you're looking, you know, probably between a thousand and twenty five hundred dollars for a good macro lens. But our lenses have the ability to to capture macro photographs, but you have to add an extension tube. So all you're doing basically is changing your, with adding an extension tube, all you're doing is changing your minimum focal distance. 
So a 600F4, the minimum focal distance might be 12 feet. Well, if you add an extension tube, 30 millimeter extension tube, you might be able to get that down to three feet. So if you are wanting to do macro with a, a big lens, and I'm not suggesting you go out and do macro with your 600, but with uh, the zooms that we all carry around, it's hardly any weight at all. And you're instead of buying a, a $2,000 lens or a $1,500 lens, you're buying an extension tube that you can still use your utilize your autofocus with, and the cost the on the expensive end for a set of these is about $125. So it's a much cheaper option. Plus, you save the space in your pack, you save the weight in your pack of carrying an extra lens around with just this little piece of equipment. It's just a tube, basically that gets the uh, the lens or the glass element further away from the sensor. So it decreases the minimum focal distance. That's all you need to accomplish. And now you've turned a zoom lens into a macro lens. So it's pretty short, sweet, but it's a good good equipment to carry, I think. And the only thing you need to pay attention to, I think, with those is making sure you buy one that carries that lens information through. Because you can get a really cheap yeah. one that doesn't have all the proper connections and yep. it doesn't carry that lens information. But if you buy the one that's the brand of your camera chances are it's going to have everything you need to actually accomplish what you're trying to do. Yeah, it'll have all those contact points. Yeah, some of them, the really cheap ones, I mean, you can get them for 40 bucks. You can get a whole set of them. But then now you're turning your system into a manual focus only system because it doesn't have any of the connections. Like Michael said, just make sure you watch that it's made specifically for the mount that you use and specifically for the, you know, the style of lenses that you're using and, you're going to be good to go. And they're still on the, on the high end, literally it's 130 bucks. Yeah. And I think with you, what you said with, uh, it's not necessarily saying go take macro stuff with your 600. If you're shooting a bird feeder and it's only six feet away from a window or something, that's how you get it done because then you can use your 600 yeah, exactly. with an extension tube and still shorten that distance. Yep. Sweet. Good one. All right, my next one's to save people money as well. <laughs> Everybody likes Sweet. to keep their coins, right? So when it comes, and we've touched on this before, but it's worth bringing up again, printmaking, canvas, HD metal, whatever your preferred medium is, whatever your orders are, to shop around. There are many great manufacturers out there now, and it's a competitive marketplace. And the big thing is waiting for the sales, which happens so frequently, it's worth it. I have three or four companies that I use for these purposes. I'm, I am on their emailing list, so every sale that comes through, I hear about it. If I get an order or I'm planning on producing some materials, I wait for these sales and, and obviously place it at that time. The ones that I, I mean, and I have no affiliation with these companies whatsoever, Artbeat Studios, White House Custom Color, uh, Bay Photo, are ones in the U.S. photo show, uh, sorry, photo, oh my, all right, photo, I'm going to grab, <laughs> pausing, photo, how many times can I say photo and not finish it? <laughs> so, poster jack is the one in Canada that I use most often but my point is it's so competitive you think about any holiday whether it's christmas whether it's new year's whether it's valentine's day all these things that come along they have sales but not only that it seems like every two weeks they put some kind of either a specific product a 16 by 24 canvas or their whole website at 25 or 30 percent off so it's something to think about and it'll save you money if you have that luxury of just a week or two's flexibility sales do come along and, and most of these manufacturers produce high-end quality product that that uh, I enjoy and, and make sure to watch for those sales and they'll spin off into that into part two I can't, I'm bad at this I'm sorry guys <laughs> same thing when you're traveling another way to save money is to whenever you're well first of all trip advisor reviews I always read those for where I'm traveling when I'm booking something when I'm booking uh, accommodations or vehicles through companies that I may not be familiar of, 
with in foreign countries, stuff like that. Always read the TripAdvisor reviews. But I learned this and we touched on it before, but I'll throw it out there again because it'll save you money potentially. Car rentals, I learned this this year to keep watching, even though I reserve way ahead of time for a trip for whatever the vehicle is that I'm renting, to check even the week before because rates do change. And I've been able to cancel previously reserved vehicles and save hundreds of dollars because the rate was cheaper. And maybe that company may be a, a different company that offers the same product at that time. So to keep an eye on that, just going on the popular sites like Expedia or Travelocity, that kind of stuff, I'll go on, I'll watch, and I've saved money last minute by switching up rentals too. Sorry. A couple of curveballs there, but the print the print one is a big deal for those of you that are in into it. And, and there's so many sales that just they cycle through them. It's so competitive, this this industry that they're in. It's a good way to save money. I mean, both those tips are, are really good. And, and the more money you save doing that kind of stuff, the more you get to spend on another piece of gear or a photo trip. Well, it increases your profit margin. You know, if you sell a 16 by 24 for X amount of dollars and it's 30% off, then you've saved, you've made that much more money on the product. Right. Too. All right. So but, how many of these are we doing? I don't even know how many we've done. Good on time. We're going to have to shut it down soon and, and i love this one. we're gonna a have a two-hour podcast here in a little bit but that's oh, okay. good i like it i like it i think i have two more dos mas all right well i have yep. a bunch more but i'm just gonna do i think i'll just do one more and then we'll just save the rest for another episode so ron earlier you were talking about all the accessories for that gopro mm -hmm. that and i don't know what they if they're are they going to be made by GoPro, these accessories, or are they just... Yes. Okay, so... Yeah, they are. One of the things you said was an LED light for the GoPro. I was on a shoot the other day. We were in this dark place, and, and we had to shoot stills of this particular thing, and I didn't bring any lights because we're traveling, and, and but there was no other way, and I'm like, how the heck are we going to do this? I mean, it's going to be so grainy because we're going to have to run the ISO up so high that this is going to be a horrible picture. And one of the guys I was shooting with, he pulls out this little itty bitty light. And I'm like, what the heck is that? Well, it's this little aperture, aperture, I don't know how they say it. I was like, yeah, you got to be kidding me. So it's this itty bitty little light. And it's all, you just USB charge it. And it goes on, it's, it's, it comes with a little mount that'll go on the top of your camera. But it's just bright enough to, you know, what we were shooting was kind of like a little macro thing. But it gave us enough light to actually get a really decent shot, spur of the moment. And it's, it's half, a third the size of my cell phone. It's I the mean, size of a playing card, deck of cards. Yeah, deck of cards. And it's, it has this little, uh, so that's the light. And it has this little cover that's magnetic. So what you can do is you can take and put, they send you uh, gels. So you can put a gel in between. So you take this little gel piece. Let me just show you real quick. Uh, diffuses it? Yeah, so you can, well, you can adjust your color temperature or whatever. You just put it in between the, the plexi the magnet. magnetic plate and then the actual light. And now you've adjusted the color temperature of your light. It's amazing. 49 bucks for this little guy. And it just goes in, I, now I just take it everywhere. And I just keep it charged up. And it comes with the little mount that you use to put onto your, this little mount will go right in the hot shoe. And it connects to the light and all of a sudden you've got, I mean, even if you were going to do a little interview with somebody and you just have a nice little face shot, you know, a tight shot, this is enough light to light a whole interview as long as you don't care about what's going on in the background. And um, just an amazing little tool to have just, for those little moments. And like what I was thinking about when you mentioned it earlier was if you're out there shooting with that GoPro, that might be just the perfect thing. But like I said, it's gotta be something that's pretty tight and you're pretty close to make this effective. But <laughs> is it adjustable or is it, uh, yes, is it just yeah, the brightness is adjustable. So if you turn this little bad boy on, I can Ooh, brighten bright. it up or I can. Huh? Nice. Yeah. Where'd you buy that one? Same thing on Amazon. All right. Link in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes for sure. If we're going to pare it down to one, I'll just do this one. 
So we, we talk about light a lot and we talk about the fact that, you know, we like those nice overcast days because you can keep shooting all day. If you are in a situation where, you know, you're in a location, you're not going to make it back to, you just want to keep shooting there. There is no bad light. There's just light. That's not as good as other lights. So if you're, you know, you've got that bright overcast day. See, Raycroft is just waiting to go off right now. I can just see it in his face. <laughs> Sorry. But he, just listen for a minute, and I'll explain. So you've got that, that really harsh light. You're not going to get good images of necessarily the whole animal. It's definitely not going to get good environmental images. So use that portion of the day. If you've got somewhere that, you know, you've worked hard to get to, and you're not going to be back anytime soon. You're going to continue to take advantage of that situation. Use that time of day to experiment, number one. Experiment with light. Experiment with depth of field. Those dark rim light images, you can do that. You can darken that with your depth of field or with your aperture and your shutter speed and then drop, you know, drop the ISO as far as you can. But also utilize it because you want to tell the whole story of that animal, right? And this is kind of part of working that whole situation. So utilize that time of day for those detail shots that aren't necessarily going to make a print, but they they do work to tell a little bit more of the story. When we were photographing uh, bighorn sheep, there was a lot of wind, so you'd have cloud cover come over, and then the cloud cover is gone. So you could shoot in the middle of the day, and then we were kind of shut down. But I utilized those those times when the sun popped out that's when I focused on trying to get that shot of, you know, the ram's eye in the full curl of that horn. It's, you know, it's something that it's neat to look at. You're not going to sell many of those prints. A lot of people have it. But you can do that in the middle of the day and you can, you know, utilize the light that you have just by increasing your shutter speed, increasing your depth of field that kind of thing. It's going to bring your exposure down so that you can get those shots effectively. And you're not just done. You know, you're, when you go on a shoot and it's a, it's a quick run and gun, you know, three to three, four day shoot, you don't want to give up that time in the middle of the day. Sometimes you have to, but you know, take advantage of being experimental, take advantage of that light, even though it's too harsh for you know, environmental shots, you can definitely utilize it. And the other thing, the, the other place that you can utilize it is, you know, and Michael, I, I think you put this in the show notes uh, when you did the moose podcast when you were up in Alaska. Don't be afraid to shoot in high key. And that shot wasn't necessarily high key. I'm talking about a wide angle moose shot that Michael had that he switched to black and white. But don't be afraid to shoot high key which means slightly overexposed, but you still have the detail in your subject, and then switch it to a, a monochromatic image. That is one place where those midday shots can still work. And that, again, it's a little bit of experimentation more on the post-processing side, but th that time doesn't have to be lost, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And Mark quit shaking his head no, so I, I know he understands what I'm talking about now. That was a good one. I like that. Take advantage of all the time you have out there. Well, it's a good point. I agree with that. If you travel to a destination, you spend a lot of time and money to be there, then you want to enjoy it to its fullest. And there are those opportunities. I, you know, it's not as productive as, as the better light times, but For why sure. not be out there? Sure. You know, you packed your lunch and you're got your drink with you. You're good to stay out there and make, make use of it. And some of those tight shots too, like you point out with the ram's eye and the horn, you can get away with that and even light. And they're, there have been times for whitetails this even this year I targeted some of that harsher light when they were going through the hardwoods and and just capturing the animal in the one ray of light between trees to make you make use of that time so it is viable it's just not as highly productive as those other times of day but you're there for sure. for why sure. not why not be out there and you, and then you know you never know what behavior could happen that could be super unique for video or anything else too so it's always good to be out as long as you can afford to be. So my last one is is very short and sweet, but I think as a matter of perspective, 
Always remember that the camera and the photos only represent part of the experience. And take time to breathe it all in. We're out there to enjoy it. That's what we like most and love most about this, what we're most pa passionate about. And so, you know, the cameras and the photos facilitate our trip, but really make sure you enjoy your time in the field and really take in visually everything about the experience as much as you can to enjoy it. Keep the photos as the bonus, not the stress. Perfect. So you can find more of our team's work on Instagram, Facebook, on YouTube at Wild and Exposed Podcast, and of course, on our website at wildandexposed.com. We'd like to take a moment and thank our hardworking and talented producer, Missy McKenzie, for all that she does behind the scenes to bring you this podcast for your listening enjoyment on a weekly basis. And no matter which podcast platform you're listening to us on or on YouTube, Take the time to give us a positive review, a thumbs up, a five-star rating. Make sure to subscribe and follow as those all help us to do what we love to do and to bring you this podcast on an ongoing basis. Until next time, you've been listening to Wild and Exposed Podcast. Thanks for tuning in.